it says it's got your name, inmate, and yeah. when it expires, yeah. it's your work card. Yeah. Most days I go to the writing, creative writing, and some days I go to art, art classes. So you're out from nine in the morning, back to the wing at 12, get your lunch, and you're locked from half 12 to two o'clock. I'm with Glenn, a prisoner at HMP McGilligan on the north coast of Northern Ireland. Yeah. So now we've, ju we've just turned into one of the old H blocks. This is H block two. Right. That's AMP wing over there. That's for like older people, older, over 50s. And... OK. It's strange for me this, this moment yeah. now because I haven't been in this block for 15 years. Still the same, hasn't changed. A long corridor, a highly polished floor, yellow light, the smell of disinfectant, cells to left and right, steel cell doors, and everywhere, the wing hubbub. We're like a wee family down here, Carol. We all help each other and get all of them. Yeah. OK, let's look at your cell. Mm -hmm. I hope it's tidy. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Ah, this is my wee home. Right. Well, there's a prison issue bed. Bed. Comfy? Springs. There's only four beds on the wing. We springs on them. The rest of them's all boards, so I have a springy bed. How come you got a springy bed? Special prison. Oh, OK. <laughs> this is a desk. Yeah. You've actually got a desk. Yeah. Your oh, good thank you. Your lunch has just lunch arrived. Here, Vegetable soup. And yeah. You can um, have that if you want, Carol. No, it's Lovely. all right. Listen, I wouldn't. I would, I, I, thank you. I it's will. Bit, it? Do you write at the desk or do you write on the bed? I would sit in the bed with a pillow on my lap, reading. See all that on there, Carol? Yeah. That's all maybe half written stories, half written poems, letters. Grab a handful, just so there's bound to be something on there. That's a wee, that's a wee draw on my son, don't we? <laughs> See, look, that's all poems here. My God. There's hundreds. Ah, uh, that's it. And then, look. There, look. I can't read it because I've got my glasses on. That's just... My heart, hidden, rejected, and relegated to the land of black hearts. Soulless eyes where love is weakness, a threat. Neon pink doesn't exist here. Colours kept to a minimum. Maybe a flower here and there, but we pass them by, knowing that they're not for us to look at. My heart is surrounded by wickedness, dark souls reflected in glassy eyes, too doped to realise that any hearts exist here. There is only grey, Groundhog Day, with colours concealed. No rainbows pass this way. My name is Carlo Gabler. I'm a writer, and I've worked in the Northern Ireland prison system as a teacher of creative writing for 27 years. I've been in all the prisons here, and I've done everything with prisoners from basic literacy to high-end literature, from letters to victims to open university essays. Carlo is a writer, isn't he? Mm -hmm. That's what I know him as anyway. The bulk of my work has been done in the cell, unescorted. As many of the prisoners I've taught have said, I've spent a lot of time inside. It's knowing how to handle yourself around prisoners and in prison as well, so that goes a long way. Mm. Knowing mm. what to say, what not to say. Prison has been my university. Prison has been where I learnt everything I know. It's been the richest experience of my working life. I think it's made me a better writer, and it may even have made me a better person. Excuse me, you're a big guy. How are you? Grand, yourself? I'm oh, very good. Good to hear, good to hear. Very, very good. Over the years, of course, I've been quizzed about my prison work. Typically, people ask if prisoners aren't hostile or dangerous. I tell them no, prisoners aren't. Prisoners, I say, 
treat teachers with more respect than people outside ever do. And why is that? Every prisoner knows that we are theoretically there to help them. We want their lives to be better. We want to give them something. We don't want to take anything away. We don't want to tell them that they need to rehabilitate or that they've done wrong or that they should wise up or they should pull up their socks, any of those things. They have plenty of people telling them those sorts of things and they have had plenty of people telling them those sorts of things for years. What we do is we say, very simply, would you like to make something? How can I help? For about 18 years in McGabry Prison, my boss was a man called Jeff Moore. Hello, Mr. Moore. Please can come I in. come in? Please come in. It's good to see you. Man. Before I left for my one-to-ones in the cells, I'd say, cheerio, Jeff, I'm off to do some teaching. And he'd always say, no, your first task is not to teach. It's to be a human being. Carlo, when they first see you and they see this gentleman who has this upper-class English accent, they're very suspicious. They're very suspicious of this man who's walking into their cells. What's he doing? What are you, what are you about? And then a month later, they'll come into me and they'll stick their thumbs up in the air and they'll say, brilliant, Jeff. That's a brilliant man. Where, where did you get him from? You know, oh, I want to go to his class. I want him to keep coming to me. And it's, it's, it's the human nature of the thing. Do you think, were we any good? Did we have any use? I think we did, Carlo. McGilligan Prison used to be an army camp in the Second World War. As I go through the turnstiles and pass the rows of Nissen huts, which are used today as classrooms and a library, prisoners are streaming from their morning's activities looking like men you might see anywhere. Only these ones are hurrying not to homes or offices, but to cells. This is the movement time. So people come to education in the morning and then they have to go back to the blocks, they have to go back to the cells for lunch, etc. and then they come back in the afternoon. Right, so we are on press one the press. Yeah, right. Uh, the sailings made me stand as if I heard sound for the first time. <laughs> yeah, we're a little rat. That's a kind Great. of contradiction there, isn't it? Yeah. I've come to meet Pamela Brown, who's the Prison Arts Foundation writer in residence at McGilligan. She teaches in a porter cabin on the edge of the prison's learning and skills section. And in the class I've dropped into, there's about a dozen men. Yeah. Reading is like a scene of freedom and escape. Lovely. That's a really good one. Is that another tame? Yeah, yeah. I came here as a tutor. I was asked to do 11 weeks, 12 weeks of a creative writing course through an art skills programme, and I thought I could do 12 weeks and that was in 2011. So I didn't come with any of that, I'm here to rehabilitate, I'm here to do this, I'm here to do that. I came to deliver a creative writing course and then all of that faltered in. I started to see how different prison writing was. I've got my own vendetta and it's about to get real. I'm gonna take you to a world of concrete and steel, a jungle where only a stronger survive. The bottom of a food chain, it's hard to stay alive. Don't get me wrong, it's not all doom and gloom. The first time I came to McGilligan, I sat in this chair that I'm sitting in and taught in this room. OK, Pamela, when people come here, yeah. what do they come with, the men? Well, I think you come with your story, and especially a lot of the younger guys who come, they come with their story and they want to tell their story. And by telling that, I think it helps them self-reflect as well. They can see it on paper and they understand how difficult that experience has been for them. And I think particularly that age group are then wondering, how do you change that? Rain is pelting on the tin roof of the prison library where I find Jamie. Did you go, did you go to Pamela's class? Hi. Yeah. I'm an order in there. What, do you write poetry or...? I do, but I uh, will try. <laughs> Jamie never wrote before he came to prison. I think for the first, the first half an hour when I was in your class, I would, within that first half hour, I would have fallen home and I'd never lifted a book or nothing like it when I was outside. Like. 
Can you remember the poem? Well, it was called uh, My Journey Through the Care System. I was brought up in care, so I feel as if I was failed by the care system. So when I was when I wrote, I wrote a big story about the, my whole journey through it. And to be honest, it felt as if it was a relief of getting something off my chest and getting that finally out in the open. And a lot of them are engaging with education for the first time. A lot of them can't read. A lot of them have taught themselves to read while they've been maybe, you know, on their own, spending long periods of time on their own. I mean, my experience of teaching in prison is that most people would have been drifting away from derogating from school by 9, 10, yeah. might do a year at, in, in inverted commas, big yeah. school, but really by late as 13, usually 12, they're out. Yeah. Carla, one of my friends here asked me for to come, so when I came, it sort of came at the start just wondering what this place was, and then through time, it just started putting stories together. Before you came here, before you came to, you know, when you were a child, did you like school? Nah. Why not? Don't know. Couldn't stand getting told what to do. But interestingly, this morning, the group realised that you were coming in, so they started to clean the classroom. So the last 20 minutes was spent mopping. It was very important that where the writing goes on in that environment was presentable. Prisoners, shock horror, are house proud, like you and I. They also want to communicate, which in McGilligan they do via the magazine they produce with Pamela, called Time In. Back in the classroom, we're listening to some of their work. In more recent years on Ridge Valley, when the moon is full, there have been reported sightings of a strange old woman appearing on the land with a huge wolf by her side. Oh. Arr, 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 arr. Yeah. What many Mark? Happy days. Carla was near sleeping, but happy days. <laughs> <laughs> I was ah. listening. <clears throat> it struck me as a story about a werewolf. No. <laughs> a man that turned into a werewolf. It struck me as a story about prison. Right. And this jail is Ridge Valley, is it? Possibly. Yeah. <laughs> I would say most of the people in this class that have spent a bit of time in prison would sort of relate some of their stories to like a jail setting, if that makes any kind of sense. Yeah, because yeah. right. that's the only thing we really know. Dermot Healy said there's a lot of truth in the lies writers tell. Hmm. I think it's a safe place to put your truth into fiction sometimes. Hmm. Stories, and stories. Yeah, let's have a look. In Pamela's class, I catch up with Glenn, who earlier showed me the writing he kept in his cell. Does it make you feel better writing? Uh, it's like therapy, really. Writing helps me when I'm like I would write away in the cell, and I'm gonna come over here, type away on the computer. And... I mean, what what is your temperament like? Do you find being in prison? Do you, do you just sort of take it on the chin? Do you find it depressing? To you, are you, are you, it's boring. It's a boredom of it. It's just like Groundhog Day. You get up and it's the same routine and do this and do that. But when you come over here, you can sit and write on the computer and you could be on a beach or you could be away in a forest or you could be flying a plane or, yeah. and you're talking to all the other boys and having a wee coffee. And, so this actually makes it makes jail easier for boys. And all the fellas that I've met on here, they really, really enjoy the writing. They love it. Everybody sits and makes up stories and poems. and so. Yeah. People say to me, oh, you, you shouldn't do anything for prisoners. They get enough or they, they'll just steal or they'll just do this, that or the other thing. I mean, I've been in prison all my life virtually and I have yet to meet a rich man. <laughs> you know, they're, they're people who by and large have been abused themselves and they live in a culture where they learn how to abuse others. And it's trying to turn that round and trying to tell them, look, you don't have to live your whole life in an abusive way. What's this? It's been handed to me. Apparently, uh, it's, it's a poem. Read it out, would you? Break a chain, it's called. I cry, I roller coast through the past, snatching at excuses on the downhill slopes. Around and around I go again. I blame. It's easier that way, isn't it? Acceptance is unacceptable to me. 
every door I take the hinges from, I look down and I see no blame on my doorstep. I stop these days of silver and lanes caress a wise array and I realise I've got to break the chain. I watch my sons too quickly turn to men. I see the similarities. I tremble in the quiet of the night. I never share the fear that grips my soul. We men don't talk about such stuff. Yes, watching what I do the most silently. I watch them grow to men and I ask myself, have I really done enough? Mm, that's quite a remarkable poem, isn't it? Mm. I mean, that's... Well, I've never... I mean, this is the first time I've heard it, but that strikes me as a poem about extreme anxiety mm. that your children might, um, your boys might <coughs> possibly end up here. Yeah. Which is definitely not what anyone would want. No. That would be my biggest worry, like, my biggest worry in my life. That any of my sons ended up in no jail or trouble or... So... Do they listen to you? Sometimes, yeah. Being meaningfully engaged while in prison, through art or education or both, they usually come paired, is surely what every prisoner should be. If they're going to be better people, that has to be the start, doesn't it? And yet, many of us don't believe prisoners should be meaningfully engaged while in prison. We believe they're only fit for punishment. Lock them up, we say, and throw away the key. Perish the thought that we should accept prisoners are people like you and me. It has to be an argument that is won on the basis of rights, not on the basis of, is this good for our society or not? This is Phil Scraton, best known for his investigative work into the Hillsborough disaster. But he's also a critical criminologist who has written extensively about punishment and prisons. It is a human right to have education at whatever age you are in our society. It is a right to education, particularly for those people whose education has been thwarted or has been diminished. There's all sorts of different kinds of education, but is the kind that might be most helpful towards reflection and engagement focused on the arts, do you think? Yeah. The arts have a special capacity to be able to stimulate reflection, engagement, skill through reading, that broader fantasy world, which we all experience and love, or the capacity to discover something you never thought you ever had. People who learn to play the guitar, people who become incredibly accomplished musicians while they're in prison, people who become poets and writers, to be able to pick up a paintbrush and to be shown how to mix colours and to be able to express that world that you remember, but you've now been taken from. So while, you know, while it's like, all right, lads, get down there to the gym, let's see how bigger muscles we can build and all the rest of it, what the arts are doing is exercising the most important muscle, thinking, developing, ideas, futures, possibilities. It's using any stimulus that enables somebody to stay alive intellectually while they are physically locked down. I've dropped into the music class at McGilligan. It's a good stress. You are stressed to pick up the guitar, get rid of it. Yeah? Yeah. Are you stressed? No, I'm always stressed. <laughs> you look like kind of. You look pretty comfortable to me. No, I'm always stressed, then. Why? Why am I locked up with five year man? You'd be stressed. <laughs> Would I? Yeah, of course. <laughs> You'd be badly stressed. Yeah. No, but it is. Music quite me down an awful lot. What, were you belligerent? Yes, lunatic. Did they send you to the block and things like uh, yes, that? Yes, day and night. Right. Well, I'm very glad you've discovered music. Yeah. Let's let Paddy in. Let Paddy in. Paddy Nash, the musician, teaches the prisoners how to write and perform their own songs. A student of mine one time, he was, he was about to get out, and I was asking him, oh, how is he feeling about leaving? And he said to me, I've got a wee bit of gate fever. And I was fascinated just with this term, and I was asking him, and, he, and I said, what's gate fever? And he says, it's the fear 
that a prisoner feeds just before they're about to be released. And it's the fear of the unknown what's waiting for them in the outside world. So that's where the song came from. <clears throat> Tonight I lay thinking of the choices that I made and how my worst ten minutes put me where I am today. I know it won't be long right till I embrace the great unknown. Is anybody out there? Is anybody home? I can feel that old gate fever. I can feel that old gate fever. I believe in arts education for prisoners. I wouldn't have done it, and I wouldn't still be doing it if I didn't believe in it. But all this work happens within prison. What happens to the prisoner when they leave? Has my contribution made any sort of difference to their lives? There's really only one way I can find out. This is Carlo Gabler. I, I don't know if you remember. I, do you remember me? <laughs> How are you? Where are you? Yeah, that's where I am at all. I'm working in the coil. I've caught up with Stephen, whom I met in McGabry Prison. It must have been in 2007. And who I was involved with, on and off, for eight years. He's out now. And to generate income, he does some freelance writing for a website. People request articles to be written, usually SEO articles, search engine optimization, so that they get a better hit on Google with putting in keywords. The subjects that you get to write about could be scientific or art or women's health, men's health. So it's that simple. Well, it's not that simple. Well, I would try to choose subjects that I don't really need to research. There's one available, lawn care website. And I used to be a landscaper, so that would just fit me down to the tee. They, they pay you $29 to write 700 words on lawn care, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, yeah, $29.25, yep. which would be paid to you by PayPal or something like yeah, that. That's exactly. And how long would it take you to write 700 words on lawn care? Well, that's a, if, I, if I click on this write content, the, the clock starts. So it could be, oh, there it is, there are three hours. Time to complete three hours. So all the time we spent talking on many afternoons about your literary work have borne fruit. Exactly. I'm in the cell, first week of August 2007. It's a Friday. And my cellmate was there lying on his bunk, sorting out his lumps of hash or whatever he was doing, and I was just sitting on the top bunk. So you could hear bits of music and all, but you always heard when the keys jangled, you knew there was someone coming. Nervous Carlo. And we went down to the wee room, I think it was a wee classroom or something. And that was the initial meeting, just talking and mainly about me, I think it was, about why I was there and what I was reading, if I, if I liked to read and things like that. But it was always a Friday, so I always looked forward to the Fridays. I now have many friends who are ex-lifers. They're committed to their communities. They are doing all sorts of good work. For example, one guy that you and I were both involved with, who I'll not mention his name, but he's now working with uh, various charities. And he is uh, a guy who did a master's degree with us. And uh, he spends his life now helping other people. There are people, though, that we worked with, who we might have spent many years with, who wrote fairly well, who left prison and then reoffended and re-entered yeah. prison. Did we fail? Yes, of course we did in many cases. But you have to be prepared to live with a certain degree of failure mm -hmm. because it's not something that, bang, 
it's, you know, they see the light at the end of the tunnel and, and you walk out a changed person. It's a gradual change. It takes time. There might be some of your corrections on there, actually. <laughs> there could well be some of my corrections. It only took me 10 years. This is Michael Irwin. He got 12 years for smuggling narcotics. And during his sentence, he produced poems, personal essays, letters, polemics, stories, and a journal that became My Life Began at 40, Michael's first book, now published, some of which I saw in its very early stages. You first seen that as a bunch of pages, and yeah. that's the same pages. But I do remember having a long conversation with you in 2009. Do you remember about tense? Yeah. About past and present yeah. tense? and about whether, one, whether one's going to be in the moment or whether one's going to be retrospective, and how the reader needs to have his or her hand held when you shift. So it's five o'clock in the morning, HMP McGilligan. There's nobody around at the moment, you can hear a pin drop. I think I'll write a wee bit of a poem. I look at the skin in my hand under the desk lamp. It's made up of little diamonds. I think, how old am I getting? And I'm just sitting here looking at the desk and I can see that the varnish has been eroded and I wonder how many, many hands have been here before. How many thoughts. While in prison, Michael read, studied, wrote, and seized every single educational opportunity he was offered with both hands. Sure, it got the time in, but it was also, as Michael knew, necessary for his future that he do all of this. I knew that I would need letters after my name or something because whenever I would get out of prison, I'd be in my late 40s with no qualifications in a prison sentence. So the likelihood of employment was very, very low there, or employment that you would, you know, gainful employment. Were you a, a nice person before you went to prison, in your opinion, or did prison make you, I won't say nicer, but different? Wow. <laughs> um, I used to own and run pubs in London, so running your pub safely, there was always an element of, of violence there. So, so sometimes you would have to stand up. And uh, I was never afraid of doing that. Coming to prison was the same. You know, you wear this mask and, you know, you, you pretend you pretend to be tough all the time, but you're not, you know, you're, you're like every other person who's been to prison will admit, you know, you're frightened. But it, it, cha it changed me in a way that I didn't think it would be changed because I've seen other people in prison and, you know, young men who were at nothing and were told they were nothing and believed they were nothing, and all they needed was a little bit of encouragement, you know, and for me, the education department was one of those places to do that. And once I got a little a bit of education under my own wing, I was then able to become a, a classroom assistant and a mentor. Did you write letters for prisoners, write 18 ADs, which is the petition of complaint to the Secretary of State? Did you help people with their briefs? Did you do that kind of thing? I, I, was, I was all of that. The jailhouse lawyer but was there and uh, I think I rounded my complaints off to 50 for the prison ombudsman whenever it was there. But it I would also do it for other people. And because I wasn't frightened of any of this, I declared war in the prison service more or less. But uh, I, uh, I was very angry with the way people were being treated. And there was so much suicide and self-harm in prison. And, you know, I was close to it myself a few times. And I said, people should not be treated like this. So I decided to make it my own personal hobby to try and change policy, to try and make it better for those that were coming behind me. So by doing this, I created enemies within the management and security and certain staff members as well on the wings. What do you not want in a prison? You don't want a prisoner who's critically thinking, who's questioning, who's doubting, who's saying why all the time. Why are we doing this? What's this about? You know, you don't want that. What do the arts do? They get us to question. That's seen as subversive. The men talk to their leaders outside through smuggled letters, 
well aware that they may be published. One of the men is clearly an artist. He derives full publicity value from the fact that they live naked except for their blanket. HMP Mays, Longkesh, with its H-blocks and its controversial history, particularly the hunger strikes, which of course, thankfully, I missed, no longer exists physically. However, it continues to exert a powerful psychic influence. Is there a footpath? No, there's no footpath. Okay. Today, I'm back on Bog Road, where the maze once stood, where I haven't been for 20 years, at the gate where I used to go in and out to work. Yeah. And there were two big towers, or yeah. sangers. Yeah, light green. Yeah. I'm with Tim Brannigan, who I first met in the early 1990s, when he was serving time here as a Republican prisoner. I got seven years and served, almost five for possession of guns and explosives. I was arrested in October 1990 and I got out, finally got out in um, 1995. So I went in when the conflict was sort of raging at full pelt and um, I got out after the ceasefires were called. So, so the world had transformed in many ways. Did the educational facilities, services, engagements, not just with me but with everybody or anybody, did they have any virtue for you? Oh, yeah. Um, certainly on the Republican side, there was a, a marked emphasis on doing... Uh, um, they didn't really care whether it was formal education, OU, GS, GCSEs and A-levels, or whether it was informal stuff, uh, Irish history, Republican history, the nature of the struggle, you know. Every wing had a, a library, and uh, so it was just basically bookshelves stacked with the books that our relatives and f friends and supporters brought to us or sent to us. There was everything from Karl Marx and uh, the Communist Ma Manifesto right through to Shakespeare. Yeah. Quite often I would meet people who'd say to me, as I walked around this site, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. What the hell are you doing? This is the University of Terror, that was mm -hmm. one of the phrases. Or, these people are Anglo-Saxon epithet. Yeah. Now, what should I have said to them? Tell me. Um, I would have just said, well, they're human beings, and if you want to get them away from using violent methods and things like that, or support an armed struggle, if you want them to stop killing people, basically, then maybe give them books to read and show them that there are different views, different perspectives. No, not, not everyone who read a book or, re or who read, uh, you know, Thomas Hardy novel was going to decide, you know, right, I'm rejecting my Republican views all of a sudden, you know. But for me, anyway, it, it was about being introduced to new thinking and perspectives and things like that. Even if they weren't addressing the Irish struggle, um, just sometimes reading, you know, American short stories and things like that, you know, I thought, oh, well, you know, that's interesting, or I never thought of things like that, or I never viewed the world that way, or, you know, and you had little uh, epiphanies a lot of the time. Christmas week 1993, I'm sitting in an institutional blue-green cell. If I touch one wall, my fingers can almost touch the opposite wall. Photographs of loved ones and girlfriends. Wondering what they're doing now. Wondering where they are. Wondering if they mean what they say at the bottom of their letters when they sign off and say, I love you and I miss you. On my desk is a book. The book is from another prisoner to me because he knows I have a passion for American literature and it's the Granta book of the American short story. And so I take out the book and I start to read. I sort of marvel at the fact that I would forget. I do, I marvel at the fact that at times I forget I'm in a hitch block cell in the highest security prison in Western Europe. I'll always remember a poster which hung in the library of one of the prisons I worked in which said, Escape with a book. It was true. 
through literature, or making literature, or making anything, a prisoner can transcend jail temporarily. At the same time, though, which those who believe prison is a holiday camp would do well to remember, prison is always prison. Not one minute of my time inside did I enjoy it. Some people break in a day, or a week, or a month. It's tough. When you say people break, what do you mean? Personal issues and self-harming or bullying people, you know, whatever it is, it, it just affects everybody differently. You know? We know people in common that have taken advantage of the education in, in the penal system here, and it's the best way to go. So I, I left prison, I got my degree, did a master's. Four months later, the book was printed, published, called My Life Began at 40. And for me, that was... That was it. I'd done everything that I wanted to do. I'd got the letters after my name, I got my book published. And I was like, what next? So I suppose that in more recent years, I, I've written a memoir called Where Are You Really From? which is the question I get asked most in life because I'm a black person in a white city. So I wrote that and it was quite successful and I quite a unique story I guess um, and it has led to numerous film offers and two years ago I sold the rights to producer in America John Lesher uh, who uh, won an Oscar for Birdman I think about 2015 and so we're in the script development stage and hopefully in a year or two there'll be a, a Hollywood movie out of it all you know oh, yeah a lot of people benefit yeah. you know you'd like to think that they would stick to it and get busy when you get out. Do you see some of these people that you met in prison when you're in walking around town? I do quite a lot. Well, I see a lot of former prisoners that I've met. Some of them are doing OK. Some of them are, are sitting homeless, begging on the street, addicted to whatever substance they're on. I see that more often, I think. That development of drugs in the community and in prison, that, de that development is something that has been brewing for so long but now has come fully to fruition. It's important to remember, those who relish punishment, that prison can often facilitate addiction, further damaging damaged psyches, and that the fact of having been in jail is a huge impediment to employment in and of itself, after prison. I didn't tell him everything. As an ordinary Republican, I'm just seen as someone with a terrorist record or a criminal record. So I'm still struggling to find work. And like a lot of ex-prisoners, a lot of the work that I would be expected to do these days would be taxi driving and door staff and things like that, but I still have higher ambitions and hopefully I'll get there, but it is not easy. The law in Northern Ireland states that any person who serves a sentence of more than two and a half years will never have their conviction spent. So I served a 12 year sentence, so I will never, I'm like a lifer, I will never have a spent conviction. And one of the only areas that I can work in with a criminology and psychology degree is within the criminal justice system. But they're not allowed to employ me because <laughs> I will never have a spent conviction. So the place where my six years of experience from a prisoner combined with my six years of knowledge as an academic and then developing that, the people who benefit the most from it are not allowed to employ me. I'm with Glenn in his cell again, and his hundreds of pages of writing. Are you going to take all this home with you? No. I never do. I'd be stumped, so does. Why? I don't know. See, when I'm going, all that will all be put together. Put on their black bag and through the bun. And they have tears. So. Maybe, maybe you should... Take these out? Yeah, maybe you should think about taking them home. Mm. I think, um, I think they're locking. I can hear the man closing the doors. Yeah. 
Nice to be taken. Good luck. What Glenn tells me isn't a surprise. I've heard it all before. When he leaves, a man jettisons the artistic self he found in jail and reverts to his pre-jail self. This is a common failure. So there are many setbacks in this line of work, but there are also triumphs. During the making of this program, the Kersler Foundation judged numerous works of art of all kinds from prisons all over the United Kingdom. The writers at McGilligan received 21 awards in total, an unprecedented number for the prison. Glenn won a gold award for a short story. Reading is like the flight to freedom I have dreamed of all my life. That's really good, that. And Jamie got commended for his story about his journey through the care system. I wouldn't even have loved a book, to be honest with you. And then you did when you came here? I started once I joined Palmer's class, I started. Hmm. That's probably the, the only... Th Helping people to sing in their own voice is probably the only thing worth doing. If I am able to help somebody to articulate something complex and buried using language appropriately, carefully, diligently, conscientiously, I've done something. I've done something good. I haven't made the world a worse place. May have made it a better place, but I haven't made it a worse place. And the reason I feel comfortable when I'm in a class here or talking to men in their cells is that I am in a position to facilitate making something good. When you go into prison and you do that range of work that you've done and nobody knows it better than you do, you go in and you see the engagement. You know that every prisoner that you're going to work with that day has been counting the minutes until you walk through that door. Because you're going to offer an external, independent way of that prisoner being able to use their mind, use their brain, that in this desert of punishment, there is an oasis of creativity. For me, without yourself and a few others, I don't think I'd have made it through prison. Why not? Because I needed something to do, and if I hadn't had the support and encouragement, I mean, I, I would have died. I'd have killed myself, like, no doubt. Prison nearly killed me, and you guys allowed me to live through it. Thank you very much.